Hi church, it's so good to be sharing God's word with you on the first Sunday of this year, 2021. Happy New Year to every single one of you. Pray that God's blessing, and God's favor, and God's love will be poured over you this year. And uh, uh, let's, let's just open this, this, uh, this day with prayer. Father, as we come to you with a new year, Lord, we look to you. You are our source, you are our hope, you are our joy, you are our peace. I pray for every person that's watching today, Lord, that your peace would come. Fill our hearts, transform our lives, Lord. And Father, we also, as we commit your word to you, that you, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we'd hear you, Spirit of God, that you'd open our hearts to discern and understand what it is that you are sharing with us, your church today, Lord. We commit it all to you. We pray that you'll be glorified and that you'll be exalted through it. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great Sunday to be preaching. Um, you know, it's always New Year's resolutions. What amazes me is our ability, our resilience to always expect some change. You know, I think it's about the 15th year that I've said that this is the year I'm going to lose weight and get fit. Um, and I'm not going to give up because uh, it's been 15 years, maybe 16 years, maybe 17 years, but, but we're going to get there. I was looking at a whole number of traditions that they are around the world when it comes to New Year's. And I found a few bizarre ones, and I'm only going to share two of them with you today. The first one is in Italy. Did you know that the Italians, one of their traditions is that at the end of the year, they take a lot of their furniture, it's soft furniture, cushions and blankets, and, and things that don't, don't bring them joy anymore. And at, mid -years, they, at, at midnight, they just toss them out the window. And they throw them out the window, and this signifies to, to them and to everybody around them that they're getting rid of the old, and they're ushering in the new year. Uh, one of the most bizarre ones I found was in Romania. Uh, I'm not so sure. I think that these guys do this after they've had far too much to drink, but this is what they do. The farmers in uh, Romania, what happens is they communicate with their animals. That's correct. They communicate with their animals, and, and this is what they believe. If they are able to communicate with their animals and they're successful in doing it, then they're going to have a good year. Now, my question is, how do you know when you've communicated with your animals? And so a whole bunch of weird things are happening as we move into a new year every year. The thing about New Year is that we are anticipating change. We're anticipating something new to come. And that's what I want to speak to you about today, is about anticipating something. And what I want to chat about is anticipating the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you, you would refer to it the, as the end of the world, as the world ends, or the return of Christ. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. Over the last 10 months as we face COVID, I think one of the questions that has been in everybody's hearts and minds at some point has been this question. Are we at the end of the world? Is this the end that the, the Bible prophesies and predicts? I was playing golf on, I think it was Thursday, we played, myself and Rick played, and we played with two guys, we've never met them before, I met them on the first tee box, and we were chatting, and as always, you know, people always ask you, what do you do? So I said, I'm a pastor, and, and on the golf course, I get the same answer every time I say that, the guy goes, oh, well, this round, I'm not going to be swearing. Well, it doesn't take long, and then they start to swear again, so, um, but we were driving down one of the fairways, and, and one of the guys came to me and said, you know, you're a pastor, let me ask you this question. Is this the end of the world that the Bible tells us that we're facing through this COVID crisis? Well, the thing is, is we don't know if this is right now the end of the world. But what COVID should have prompted in your heart and in my heart is the question, are we at the end? Does this, is this the start of the end? And hopefully the more important question, am I ready if this is the end of the world? So I'm going to look at the first question. I'm going to look at two questions today. The first one is this, are we at the end and how do we know? And the second one is, if we are at the end, does the Bible tell us how we should live in the end times? And so that's where we're going. And so you could follow me with those two questions. You see, the Bible tells us that at the end of the world, that we should be looking for signs that will, be, that will signal that the end is here. You see, the Bible's not silent about the end of the world. The Bible is not silent about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we should look out and watch out for signs. Let me read to you Matthew 24 from verse 1 to 8. It says, As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, Do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. 
Later, Jesus sat at the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us what will happen. Tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? There's the question. Lord Jesus, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? I want you to take note of this. Jesus does not respond by saying, there are no signs, you won't know, you'll have no clue. In fact, Jesus responds like this. This is his response to that question. What will be the signal of your return? What will be the signal of the end of the world? Jesus told him in verse 4, do not let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But do not panic. Yes, these signs must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. And so Jesus tells them to this question. How do we know the end's coming? Well, there will be signs that you need to watch. Later on in, that, in chapter 24, verse 32 and for the verse 33, Jesus concludes and he says, Now learn from a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, these things that he spoke about earlier, you see these things, these signs are going to be visible signs. They're going to be tangible signs. When you see them, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I know that you may be asking, but Nick, doesn't the Bible tell us that nobody knows the day or the hour? Of course, the Bible does say that. Mark chapter 13, verse 32, Matthew 24, 36, and Acts chapter 1, verse 7, all tell us that nobody will know the day nor the hour. But Jesus tells us that when we look to these signs that are going to signal the end of the world, it's like a woman in labor. Now, my vast experience of childbirth makes me understand it this way is that my understanding of childbirth is that it starts with contractions. It means that a woman has a, a, they painful, but these contractions become more painful the closer you get to the birth. They intensify in their pain the closer you get to your birth, and they intensify in their, re in their regularity. They become more frequent the closer you get to the birth of a child. This was very evident for me when, when Elizabeth was born. I remember that Deirdre went into the hospital. It was early in the morning. She had her contractions. They weren't too painful in the beginning, but they were there. But as time went by and as the hours went by and the contractions became more frequent and the pain started to increase, we knew that Elizabeth was going to be born. But we didn't know the exact hour. We didn't know the exact time. We knew that in the space of time, we knew the season we were in. We knew, we understood that childbirth, that, that our child was going to be born. But we had no idea when. In fact, what happened to us is that um, we were relaxing because we, we felt that we had hours according to the doctor. And then they came to look at the monitor and, and the nurse ran out and she called the doctor and he looked at the monitor and he went out and then he came in and he said, listen here, we need to do an emergency seizure. So we thought Elizabeth was going to be born in hours to come, but in the next 15 minutes she was born. And you see, I think this is what Jesus is telling us. That when you look at the signs, it's like a woman going to labor. You know that she's going to give birth. But nobody knows exactly when. Remember in those days there weren't C-sections. You couldn't book Tuesday 12 o'clock. It was all natural birth. And so although that, that we, we, we can look at these signals, we can look at these signs, they indicate to us that we are heading towards the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the end of the world. Yet, although we understand and discern the season we're in, we still don't know the precise hour and the precise day of when Christ will return. When we start to look at these signs, and I don't want to preach on the signs today, I just want to use this as an introduction, but if you want to go and look at the signs of the times and, and the signs that the Bible tells us to look at, you go and do your own study. Let me give you some portion of scripture that you can go and study yourself. The book of Daniel is a great place to go and study, to look for the signs of the end times or the return of Jesus Christ. Ezekiel chapter 37, Zechariah chapter 12 from verse 10 to 14. Matthew chapter 24 and 25, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, 2 Thessalonians 2, 
1 to 12. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11. 2 Peter chapter 2 is a good, good place to go and read. The whole book of Jude, it's only one chapter. Go and read that. And then obviously the book of Revelation. You see, the Bible tells us what Jesus is telling us is, is that we need to look for signs. And we need to look for signs as they intensify. And we need to look at signs as they become more frequent. Well, when you look at Matthew chapter 24, there's a couple of things that Jesus said we should look at. Things like this, wars, violence, lawlessness, drought, famine, natural disasters, earthquakes, disease and pandemics. I did a study a while ago. And I looked at the last 150 years. It is alarming to see how in those few category of things, how they have intensified and become more frequent in this world that we live in today. One of the things that's interesting is in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. It tells us what people will be like in the end times. You know what people are going to be like? It's going to be all about me. That is, what the, the, that is what the culture of mankind is going to be like. It's about me. It's about how it affects me. And everything revolves around me. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. For people will love only themselves and their money. Doesn't that sound, sound like our society today? I always remember how Rulof always would say, uh, he said a few times from the pulpit here, you know, sometimes a man, you could sleep with his wife, he'll forgive you. But if you mess with his money, he'll never forgive you. It's because I think we're living in a time where people are in love with themselves and with their money. They will be boastful and proud scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will be act religious, but they will reject the power that can, could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. You see, this, this portion of Scripture tells us what people are going to be like at the end times. You know what the sad thing is? Is that they, they're going to be like this even in the church. People are going to still be coming to church, going through the rituals, but they're going to deny the ability of Jesus Christ to change their lives, the power of God in their lives. And instead of changing from this, they're going to remain just as they are, even though they find themselves in the church. One of the sure signs that we have entered the end times is the regathering of the Jewish people. Jeremiah 30, 1 to 5. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11. The whole ch chapter of Ezekiel 37. Zechariah 10, 6 to 10. All speaks about the end times and the gathering and the regathering of God's people, the Jewish nation. Did you know that in AD 35, that, that the Jewish nation dispersed and no longer had their land? You know, it took 1,913 years later, 1948, where the people of Israel were given their land back, and the people of Israel who were dispersed into this world started to return back to Israel. They became a nation again in 1948. It's a significant part of prophecy and end time prophecy that the Jewish nation was reestablished. The Bible, uh, 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 a, a writer, Randall Price, writes this. The modern return of Jewish people to the land of Israel has been called the miracle of the Mediterranean. Such a return by people group that had been scattered among the nations is unprecedented in history. Indeed, the Jewish people are, only ex are the only exiled people to remain a distinct people despite being dispersed to more than 70 countries for more than 20 centuries. The mighty empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome all ravaged their land, took their people captive, and scattered them throughout the earth. Even after this, they suffered persecution and holocaust in the lands which they were exiled. Yet, all of these ancient kingdoms have turned to dust and the former glories remain only as mu museum relics. And many of the nations opposed to the Jews have suffered economically, politically, and religious decline. But Jewish people who they enslaved and tried to eradicate live free and have become a nation again. 2009 was the first year since AD 35 that there were more Jewish people living in, the, in Israel than there were in any other country in the world. It's a sure sign that we're entering into the end times. The second sure sign that we're entering into the end times is global apostasy. Now apostasy means a departure from truth, 
moral truth, scriptural truth, a coldness towards God. Go and read about this in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Jude, the whole chapter, one, one of Jude. I've been in the Christian, Christian circles for 25 years. I've been committed to the church, serving the church. And I want to say to you that 25 years ago, what we used to believe as the church was sin, because that's what the Bible taught. Today, the very church who 25 years ago thought it was sin is encouraging it, some of these sins, as right and as normal. It's called apostasy. It's apostasy when you start to move away from spiritual and moral truth. And it's going to happen within the church. I've over the last 25 years seen where we were very clear as God's people about what was sin and what was acceptable before God, according to his word of God, where we sit today where people will argue, Christians will argue and argue and argue and are confused about what's moral before God and what's right before God. And this new wave is coming in where morality and what is right sits with your interpretation of what the Bible says. The Bible warns us against that and says that's apostasy. Another form of apostasy is that people are cold towards God and fall away from, from God and fall away from Christianity. I've never seen what I've seen happen over the five, last five years in my life. In the last five years, I've seen prominent Christians, leaders in the church who are leading worship and leading churches and preaching turn around and deny their faith. Move away, not just move away from the church, but move away from Christianity and deny Christianity. I've never seen it before. But it's becoming more and more prominent, more and more rife in the world that we live in today. The Bible warns us and says in the end times, people are going to get cold and be cold towards God. Listen to a, a quote from John Phillips. He says, something we can look to a worldwide spiritual awakening before the rapture. But a passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 to 3 indicates the opposite. The world will depart from their faith. God might indeed send a revival before the rapture, but the scriptures does not prophesy this. One of the scary things for me is if I look at COVID, I look at what's happened to God's church over the last 10 months or so. The, what we've seen from research is that a third of Christians have fallen away from God over this, these last 10 or 12 months. It means a third of your life group, a third of your, our, our family in this church. But listen to the staggering number. If there's 2.6 million, a billion, 2.6 billion Christians in this world, it means if these stats are right, about 865 million Christians have fallen away from God over the last 12 months of this, uh, uh, in our lifetime, in the last 12 months. 865 million people have potentially fallen away from God. That sounds like a great apostasy. There's two things that you need to keep your eye on which haven't happened yet. Obviously, we're looking to a peace treaty in uh, the Middle East, which will kick off the tribulation time. We're also looking, the Bible tells us, well, the peace treaty, go and look at Daniel 9, 27, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. The Bible also tells us that we should look for a, re a reuniting of the Roman Empire. Now many think that's what the European uh, Union is a precursor for, this 10 nations that are gonna get together out of Europe, this Roman Empire. So you need to watch for that. Daniel 2, 4, 41 to 44, Daniel 7, 7 and Daniel 7, 24 all talk about this reuniting of these 10 nations of the Roman Empire. I just wanted to touch on that because when you start to look at the signs, and Jesus says, look at the signs, when you start to look at them, you start to understand that there is a major shift in intensity and frequency of pro prophetic signs within our day today. I think the birth pains have started. I think we're living in the birth pains. I think we can see the intensifying of these birth pains. And so the question would be, if we're starting to move rapidly according to the schedule of God and prophecy in the word of God to the end of the world, then how should we live? How should this impact our lives? Should we all move to Cape Town and go run up the mountain so we could be safe? Should we buy more guns and ammunition? Should we stockpile food? <coughs> The Bible tell, doesn't say any of that. The Bible, in fact, tells us to become more passionate, committed, and have more zeal for certain things. And I want to speak to you about five things that the Bible tells us we should become far more passionate about as we see the end approaching. I want you to take it to, this as a scorecard today. 
I want you to take these five, uh, these five points that I'm going to make. I want you to score yourself today. I want you to ask yourself the question, if this is the end, if we are moving towards the end, am I ready? Am I ready? Am I ready according to the, 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 the truths that the Bible teaches, the things that I should be passionate about before Jesus returns? Am I ready? And let's see how we do in our score in, in these five things today. The first thing is this. As you see the approaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we move into the end times, you must know God and you must be awake and alert. Matthew 25 says this from verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet their bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil, olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. A signal of the end. The signal is there. Come on, guys. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy, to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then Rose, who were ready, went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know the day or the hour of my return. You see, this, this is a story not about people that, that are saved and unsaved. This is a story about the church. The, Jesus is giving us a parable about his church. He's saying that when he returns, when the day comes and the end comes and the, the second coming of Christ is here, half of the church is going to be asleep. Half of the church is going to be drowsy. Half of the church is not going to be ready for him. I want you to notice things about this parable. It wasn't, the readiness wasn't about whether they were good or bad. It was whether they were awake or asleep. Only those that were awake went. And yes, is the most significant one. Those that were asleep thought they knew him. Lord, Lord, they cried out. But he didn't know them. He said, I don't know you. And so the very first principle that, uh, that we need to understand is this, that you need to know God. You need to know God and you need to give, prepare. The, the starting point for preparation for the end times is that you know God. Say, Nick, how do I know that I know God? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's two things there. You need to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is my Savior. You need to be able to stand in front of people and say, I believe in Jesus Christ and he is my Lord and I'm going to, I am going to serve him with my life. The second thing that we see is critically important is that you must believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Why is that significant? Because it means that you don't believe that good people go to heaven. It means that you don't believe that all roads lead to heaven. It means that you believe with all your heart that there's only one way to, to be right with God and that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way to eternity with God and that is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else. You know the, that, that stats tell us, Barna has done research, that 50% of the church believe that good people will still go to heaven. You know, 50% of the church believe that all roads lead to God. Well, Romans 10, 9 says no. Those that are truly saved, those who truly know God, believe that Jesus Christ is only, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. The third thing is that your life must change. When you come to know Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that th this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone and the new has come. You see, when, you have a, when God knows you and you know God, your life begins to change. You become more like him. If your life isn't changing, you're not becoming more like him. And the question is, do you then know him? The fourth thing is this, that you must have a dynamic and real relationship with God. It means that when you're praying, when you're reading your Bible, and as you live your life, you're interacting with God. You are hearing Him. You're speaking to Him, and you hear Him speak back to you. There's a relationship. If you can tick all those four things, then surely you are saved. Surely you know Him. Surely He knows you. 
But the second thing that this, this parable tells us is that we must be ready and we must be alert. You see, when it, this word alert just simply means that you're quick to notice anything unusual or potentially dangerous or difficult. You're vigilant and watchful. The foolish virgins, the Bible, the, the word used there describes them as dull, sleepy, lethargic, and brainless. You say to me, Nick, how do I know if I'm, a, 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 if I'm alert, if I am a, a watchful? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. How's your Bible reading? How's your Bible reading being over this COVID period? Are you getting more stuck into the Word of God? Are you hearing God more? Are you being more committed to the Word of God? Has it gone over the last 10 months? If you are saying to me, Nick, I've gone backwards. I haven't gone forwards in this area of my life. Then you need to put a question mark. The second thing is, how's your prayer life? Same question. Are you going forward in your prayer life or are you going backwards in your prayer life? What's happened over the last 12 months under COVID when we haven't been able to gather and we haven't been able to encourage each other like we normally have? What's happened? Is your prayer life going forward or is your prayer life going backwards? How about serving God? Has your passion to serve God and for God to use your life and for, for your love for the church and for the church to be impactful in this world, in this community, has it increased or decreased over the last 12 months? You see, it's an easy answer. If you're saying to me, Nick, it's, it's gone backwards, and I want to say to you, you're falling asleep. You're being lethargic. You're being dull. There's a warning that you need to heed as the end comes. Wake up. Because you don't want to be one of those five virgins that when God returns is fast asleep. The second thing we see is that we need to be passionate about being a witness for Jesus. So the first one is that we need to know God and be ready and alert. The second one is this. We need to be passionate about being a witness for Jesus. Listen to Acts 1, 6 to 8. It says, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You see, the disciples come and they say, Lord, is this the end? Is this you? Are you going to reestablish your kingdom as it says in the end? Can we, can we wait for the end now? Is it coming, Lord? Jesus says to him, no, 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 wait. While you wait for the end to come, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be full of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be a witness, an eyewitness and an ear witness. I want you to tell people what you've heard about me. And I want you to tell people what you've seen me do for you. And this word, martyr, I mean this word witness also means martyr. It's the same word. It means that you'll be willing to give up your life. And so when I look at that, I think, you know what Jesus is saying to us? As we, as we anticipate the end of the world, as we look to the end of the world, what we should be saying is, God, fill me with your spirit. Help me to be a witness. Help me to be an ear witness. Let me tell people what I hear about you. Let me tell people what I know about you. Let me tell people what you've done in my life. And let me do that, Lord. I'll do that even if it means it will cost my life. You know, if I say it like that, many Christians will say, yes, hallelujah, amen, brother. Preach it, brother. That's what it is. But you see, the thing that I've noticed around COVID in the last 12 months is that Christians have gone into hiding because they're scared that they're going to lose their lives. That, that, that witnessing has been put onto the back shelf because people are scared they're going to get a virus and they don't want to interact with people. And, and so my question is, what happens when real persecution comes? What happens when you can lose your life and lose your family and be in prison because of your faith in Jesus Christ? I want to encourage you today, don't let a virus stop you from being a witness and as you see Jesus return being imminent become more passionate about being an ear witness and an eye witness even if it means that you'll lose your life because that's what the end will look like the third thing is be passionate about serving God faithfully and fruitfully the Bible tells us in Matthew 25, from verse 14, 29, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but there's a, a parable there of the talents. It means, and Jesus tells them that there's a manager that, that goes away. And basically this story, this parable is about Jesus Christ. It's about the, between the time of his ascension and his return. And between his time of his ascension and return, he's going to give people, his people, his church, you and me, talents. He's going to give us gifts. He's going to give us resources. He's going to give us skills. And what he wants us to do with those skills as we wait for his return is use them to build his kingdom. Use them to advance his kingdom, to grow his kingdom. The Bible tells us that when, when he returns, he's going to ask us the question, 
What have you done with the talents I've given you to build my kingdom? And we will respond differently. Some will say, Lord, you gave me five, and I, I was able to be fruitful, and I made another five. Another one, one of us will say, no, Lord, I had two, and I was fruitful, and I made another two. But some of us are going to say, Lord, you gave, I had one, but I was so scared to use it, Lord. So I put it in the ground, and I was hoping that, that, that you'd be okay with it. And God's going to say, man, that's not what I wanted from your life. What I wanted from your life is to use all the resources and the skills that I've given you to build my kingdom. You see, the challenge we have today is that we use our resources and our skills and, and, and all the talents that God has given us to build our kingdoms. And then we think about building God's kingdom. And you see, this, this, this parable tells us now that we need to be faithful with the talents that God's given us. Faithfulness means this, that we're consistent that we consistently are using the gifts and the talents and the resources God has given us to build his church, to grow his kingdom. I want to ask you this question because I've seen it so many times in my own life and other people's lives. Consistency in serving God faithfully is a challenge because every time your life changes, it gets challenged. Every time you have another child, it gets challenged. Every time you change a job, it gets challenged. Every time you want to do studies, it gets challenged. Every time you, you sit back and say, I don't have the time to serve God right now, it's challenged. You see, every time you say, God, I don't have the time to serve you. I don't have the opportunity to serve you because of my life. You are hiding and you're putting those, those gifts and those resources and those talents and those skills that God, you're putting them into the ground and not using them for the kingdom of God. The second thing is there has to be fruitfulness. Fruitfulness just means that there's, there's a return on the work you're doing. And you want to say to me, Nick, how do I know that, that I'm being fruitful in serving God? Well, your, your talents and your skills and your resources, they should be leading people to Jesus Christ. They should be helping people grow in their faith. They should be helping people grow in their understanding and their knowledge of the Lord. They should be helping people grow in their ability to serve God and be a witness for God. They should be helping the church and empowering the church to fulfill the mandate that God has called the church to do in that particular community. You see, your skills, your talents, your resources need to be making an impact for the kingdom of God because that's what fruitfulness looks like. And so as we look at the last 12 months or 10 months of COVID, let me ask you this question. Have you been faithful and fruitful in your serving? Or have you been putting it aside and hoping that you'll pick it up again when this passes on? I want to encourage you. God, God, God wants you to serve him faithfully and fruitfully even in the midst of a pandemic. The fourth thing is this. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12 says, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away. You see, what Peter writes to us here is that as you see the end times coming, as you see the second coming of the Lord Jesus coming, there's two things that we should start to see in our lives. We need to become more holy and we need to be more godly. You see, holy simply means that you become different, you, you, unique. And godly means that you are like God. And so it means this, that we become uniquely more like God. Opposed to becoming more like the world. In 1 Peter, Peter picks up on this. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 13, 6. It says, therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And, and Peter's refer, referring here to Levit, Leviticus chapter 11 and Leviticus chapter 19. The whole point was this, God was telling the people of Israel, I want you to be different to the other nations. I want you to be holy because you're different to them, holy and unique. And you know what's going to make you holy and unique is that you're going to be godly. You're going to be like me. You're going to follow my patterns. You're going to follow my systems. You're going to follow my thinking. You're going to follow my plans and my purposes, not the worldly plans of the other nations, not their patterns. And so the, the, the application for you and for me in this time is as we see Jesus coming, we should become more like Christ. 
and less like the world. All the time, the closer he comes, the more imminent his return is, the more holy and godly God's people should become. I want to ask you today, is this the story of the church? Is this the story of the church, that the church, that we are becoming more like Christ? When the church is confused about things like living together, same-sex marriages, obeying authority, how we use our money, how the role of alcohol in our lives, kindness and love, living in paranoia and fear because of a pandemic and not faith. Again, I want to ask you this question. Over the last 10 to 12 months, have we faced this COVID pandemic? Have you become more godly? Have you become more uniquely godly, different from this world? When people look at your life today versus last year, this time, are you more like Jesus? Do you represent more of Christ in your life, in the way you think, in the way you act, in the way you speak? And if the answer is no, then, 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 then again, I have to say, say to all of us, guys, we have to wake up. We can't be dull. We can't be asleep. We can't be drowsy. The final one, the fifth one, that, that I want to just pick up a bit around today very quickly as I conclude. As we see the day approaching, our fellowship and our passion for fellowship should increase. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God, we can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Eliot's commentary, I love what Eliot's commentary he says he says this I think he hits the nail on the head he says let me just get it to you. yeah here we go he suggests that the start of apostasy the start of this falling away the start of this tolerance of 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 um What's the word? Spirituality and morality that isn't based on the truth of word of God, a coldness towards God, a coldness to his church. This will happen in believers when they feel it's no longer important that they meet together. There's two reasons why, very quickly. Because when you meet together with people, they encourage you and they hold you accountable. And I want to say to you today, the, the, the thing that's going to kick off apostasy and coldness in your life and my life is when we start to neglect the fellowship of the saints and we're not held accountable and we're not in courage because we're going to grow cold if we if we live our lives like that i know that over the last 10 months you're going to say to me nick i think you're being very really difficult on us we it's been it's been a pandemic and we we haven't been able to meet together i want to say to you that i think that it's 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 perspective you know that our home cells have been meeting many of our home cells have been on zoom and so you may not feel comfortable to come to a a, a, a bigger meeting but you can certainly feel comfortable about going to a person's home where there are 10 people. And I'll tell you why, because I found that there's an inconsistency. I, I saw people the other day who said to me, Nick, we will not come to church, it's too dangerous. And, and I respect people's, you know, if, if that's the way you feel, but then be consistent, because I saw those very same people at a restaurant, packed, packed restaurant, no masks, no social distancing. I saw those very same people in the Apple Eye store that was full, chock and block full. No social, I think to myself, guys, we have to be consistent. If we say that we're not going to fellowship with God's people because of, 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 of we're scared of a pandemic, then we need to be consistent in that and not, not go to the restaurants, not go to the shopping centers and all those kind of things. But we can't go to the restaurants and the shopping centers and all these things, but then refuse not to go to God and, and, and gather with God's people. We cannot neglect meeting together. Because what you need and what I need is people to encourage us and to keep us accountable. You see, the Bible tells us that 50% of Christians will be asleep when Christ returns. And I think that fellowship is a key to this. I think that fellowship will keep us on fire. I think when, you, when you're being encouraged and held accountable, you'll remain alert and on fire. And so as I conclude, there's these five signs, as we see these signs, as we see this intensity increase, as we start to discern that the end times are coming. There's the five things that are important that the Bible says, this is how you should respond. Know God. Be alert. Don't be asleep. Be passionate about your witness. 
Be willing to lose your life over it. Be an eyewitness and an ear witness for God. Be passionate about your serving of God. Be consistent and faithful in it. And be fruitful in it. Be passionate about holiness, being uniquely like God and godliness that you reflect him more and more in your life. And finally, be passionate about fellowship. Be passionate about encouraging and meeting with each other and being accountable. I want to say this. This is what I felt God say to me as I was preparing. I was saying, Lord, I feel uncomfortable to say to people, you know, we, we mustn't let COVID make us dull. Because, you know, it's a unique time of our, of, of our world. You know when I felt the Lord lay on my heart? I felt, because I said, Lord, surely you'll understand. You'll understand. You'll understand that people are in hiding. You'll understand that people are afraid. You'll understand that people are scared. You'll understand that, that people will just wait it out until we, things come back to normal. And this is all I felt God say to me. I don't, want, I don't want people to think I'll understand. I want my, my people to take a stand. So I want to encourage you today. Take a stand. As we approach the end times, and we start to see these the signs intensify in our time, become passionate about the things God is calling us to be passionate about. Don't fall asleep now. It's not the time. In Jesus' name, amen.